All right. Well, it is two o'clock. Um, I'm going to get started. So I'm David Fleischman. I'm um, a clinical associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at UNC, um, the vice chair of the department. Uh, I've been doing this lecture for Osler for, I think, almost like six years now. And I love doing it. I love meeting. I love meeting the applicants, even through a virtual, um, um, you know, system like this. But um, I try to make this interactive somehow. So, so feel free to shoot out questions through the chat, and I will keep on going through and checking the chat as we go along. Um, I have no uh, financial disclosures. Uh, most of the images um, from this are, are just uh, online searches that I thought were most applicable. Um, when I started doing this presentation years ago, I, I used to joke that, you know, like glaucoma, if you didn't know what it is right now, you're, you're in trouble. But, you know, after now doing this for almost 10 years, I realized that answering like, what is glaucoma is actually one of the hardest questions in our, in our field. Um, but you don't need to get into the philosophical for the purpose of the boards. Um, really what I'm going to do, because I know that you have, you have your, your boards coming up is that, um, I'm going to hit you hard and fast with a lot of information, hopefully in a way that you don't need to memorize things. Um, but just so that you kind of get things in a storybook, um, system, almost like a story, uh, so that you're not really memorizing little facts. Um, I, I find that to be the most useful uh, way of doing things. So, you know, when we talk about like, what is glaucoma, what's glaucomatous optic neuropathy, you know, you, I, I need you to kind of um, separate these two things out. Like glaucoma, you know, can encompass ophthalmos. It can um, encompass a crisis event where somebody's pressure has gone up, even though the optic nerve hasn't been dinged yet. But usually when we're talking about it for the purpose of your exam, they're going to talk about glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And, and there's a typical cupping pattern in atrophy of the nerve uh, with corresponding visual field loss that they really harp on. And then intraocular pressure, as you know, is a risk factor. It is not synonymous with uh, glaucoma. Um, you, you know of many cases of patients who have terrible glaucoma despite uh, pressures in the normal range. That being said, it is the only variable um, that we use to treat the disease process. So it's still probably central in, um, in, the, in the definition of the disease. And just to show you that cupping by itself is not necessarily um, glaucoma also, you know, this, this is a very cupped optic nerve, a very, very cupped optic nerve, and this nerve looks very, very healthy. I'll tell you, this is not glaucoma. This was somebody with a superior segmental optic um, atrophy. And this patient had about a 0.1 cup to disc ratio about uh, three years prior uh, has become ocular hypertensive. Um, so this change, this change in uh, optic nerve cupping, um, you know, if you just look at it without a temporal context, uh, you would say it's just a completely normal nerve. But the temporal aspect, this change over time uh, in the setting of high intraocular pressure would absolutely make this a glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Okay. Um, this is the most common cause of irreversible blindness in blacks in the U.S., and it's three to four times more, uh, uh, more likely to, to affect black patients than white patients. Black patients are three to four times more likely to go blind from glaucoma. So this is a big, big public health uh, issue. Uh, and this is amongst the leading causes, causes of blindness worldwide uh, with trachoma, cataract, and glaucoma. Remember that glaucoma is going to be the one that is uh, irreversible. Here's some genes involved in glaucoma. You're thinking... How am I going to look at this chart? How am I going to look at this chart and make this useful to me just a, like a few weeks before the, the boards? And I will tell you, you very much can do so. Uh, what you really want to do are to pick up trends or what sort of things stand out. So I'm going to look at the chat. I'm going to look at the chat box here. I'll put you all on the spot real quick, um, <laughs> all, all three of you in there. And, and if you were to tell me, you know, what is what is one thing um, that stands out to you about about all of these genes um, responsible for glaucoma, their inheritance patterns, um, as an example? And I will keep looking at my watch just to make sure that I stay on time. And I see almost all are dominant And Jason, you are you are correct. OK, so if you remember nothing else right now about about glau the glaucoma and the genes, OK, it, it, comes crunch time for the boards 
and you have a question that comes up and says, is this autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant? I want you to remember that almost all glaucomas are going to be autosomal dominant. Okay. What is the big exception here? Congenital. Okay. So you take it a step further and then you'll say, well, it's uh, they're almost all uh, autosomal dominant except for congenital glaucomas, which makes sense. I mean, regular regular run of the mill primary open angle glaucoma is very very common, so you would expect it to be dominant. And congenital glaucoma not so common, um, so it makes sense for it to be recessive. Also, you know, if you have congenital glaucoma and you go blind, you know, how likely is it going to be that you're going to pass on those genes, etc.? So yeah, it makes sense that this is a recessive, um, and these are the dominants. I'm going to also point out some of these genes, um, some of these genes over here that they sometimes like to ask on the boards. And, and again, sometimes they get confusing. I'm going to hopefully make it so that it's not confusing for you in that if it does show up on the boards and I'm fairly certain at least one of them will pop up, uh, you will get it correct. So so the the ones, the highest yield, highest yield ones uh, are going to be tiger myosil and um, which is uh, found in ju juvenile open angle glaucoma and also in 4% of primary open angle glaucomas. Found in chromosome one, um, it affects a mutation to the gene product, uh, protein myosilin. Uh, then there's optineurin, which is seen in low tension open angle glaucoma, CYP1B1, cytochrome P450 um, for congenital glaucoma, and then lysyl oxidase like protein. Um, Aloxyl one, which increases the risk of pseudo exfoliation glaucoma. So, I'm going to show you some ways to remember these uh, tiger myosilin and, and loxyl one. Uh, I'll kind of use a silly, a silly uh, mnemonic. I guess it's a mnemonic. Optineurin, uh, one way to remember optineurin. So, for low tension glaucoma, remember that this is this is not really a high eye pressure disease process. It's not a pro it's not a problem with the trabecular mesh the the optic nerve is wimpy opt opt the optic nerve is diseased in these cases and even a normal pressure is noxious to the optic nerve so you'll just remember optin optineurin op optic nerve okay for low tension open angle glaucoma for CYP1B1 we're going to go with alliteration so uh C and C for congenital and CYP1B1 uh so you're going to remember that this is the one that's responsible for congenital glaucoma and then my famous uh, so I used to I used to use this book and I was a big fan of this. I don't know if they still if they still uh, recommend these books, but I, I was I was a big fan of it. Um, I'll always remember some of these uh, these weird esoteric facts because of uh, pictures. So I created I created one or a couple of them for for these conditions. So we have loxo one for pseudo exfoliation. We have this this lovely blonde uh, girl eating lox. Okay, where where is she from? Where is she from? She's blonde and blue eyes. Just someone tell me on here on the chat. She's Scandinavian, of course. She's Scandinavian. All right, and she's eating and she's eating lox. Okay, and and so this is how you're going to remember that loxal one. That loxal one um, is associated with pseudo exfoliation. Um, and you'll remember that pseudo exfoliation is commonly seen in folks of Northern European ancestry, Scandinavian and Nordic countries. These are both Scandinavian and Nordic countries. Um, and, um, and as silly as this sounds, I bet you anything, you will not forget this. The next one is definitely a little bit more silly, but I don't care. I will do anything that I can to help you get an extra point on here, even, even if I'm making like lame dad jokes. I am I'm a proud dad, so I'm also proud of making stupid dad jokes. So here's here's my here's my stupid dad joke. Ready? So tiger myosilin for juvenile open angle glaucoma. Juvenile open angle glaucoma tends to affect teenagers. Okay. This is not the uh, old person glaucoma. This is the juvenile open angle glaucoma uh, variety. And here we have a little group of awkward teenagers. Um, I'm not sure what the context was of this photograph anymore because I did this so many so long ago. And I was like, just focus on this guy, and he gets mauled by a tiger. Okay, this whole situation is just really, really weird. Like, I, maybe it's working for you, maybe it's not. I bet you anything, you will not forget that tiger myosilin. Okay, is affecting awkward teenagers that get uh, juvenile open angle glaucoma. So.
There you go. I did it. I actually had another one uh, a while back um, for axenfeld rieger syndrome, but um, I was using Ax Axel Rose uh, as a uh, part of the mnemonic. And then it, it turned out that most people didn't know who Axel Rose was anymore. Um, so I, I think I'm getting out of date. I'm out of touch. Uh, eye pressure. What is the normal eye pressure? You know, when somebody asks, like, what's the normal eye pressure? Uh, what, what, you know, what do you answer? What is the normal eye pressure? Ten to twenty-one, yeah. So your range, your range is about ten to twenty-one. I like that. Um, and then the mean, the mean pressure uh, would be about how much? Sixteen, very good. Yeah, sixteen, yeah, sixteen, seventeen. I'll take that plus or minus three. There's a reason why I'm asking all of these things. By the way, you'll see the, the distribution. How how do we normally describe? describe the distribution of eye pressure amongst a population. So, so skewed higher is, is how we describe the particular type of um, distribution. So it, it's, you know, is it Gaussian, non-Gaussian? So we got a non-Gaussian and you're, you're, it's, and it's actually going to be skewed towards higher pressures, just like you said, you're absolutely right. And then the next question is, why is it skewed towards higher eye pressures? Why is this skewed towards higher eye pressures? Does anybody know? Anybody know? And you can say no, or you could say the wrong answer. No. Okay, good. I like it when people don't know things and I like it when I see wrong answers. Okay. I really do because that means that I'm teaching you something. Okay. If you knew everything that I was about to uh, teach you, I'm wasting your time. So um, it's good for me to see this and I promise you that you'll, you'll also know this. We're going to talk about why pressures are skewed towards higher pressures in a little bit. So what makes the eye pressure, what makes eye pressure high? So it's going to be uh, either the rate of aqueous humor production, resistance to aqueous outflow through the TM Schlumps canal, or elevated episcleral venous pressure. So the most common, the most common is going to be resistance to aqueous outflow uh, through the TM. Uh, some some rare cases of elevated elevated episcleral venous pressure, and almost unheard of for the rate of aqueous humor production to be a cause of high eye pressure. Okay, there's I think like epidemic dropsy, I think is like one of the only conditions that I know of that that is related with uh, increased aqueous humor production. And uh, some folks incorrectly attribute steroid, um, uh, excess steroids as, as uh, this mechanism, which is not really the case. Okay, what is the what is the site when you're looking at this? What is the site of a maximal resistance to aqueous outflow? This is a high yield point that I do not want you to forget. Juxtacanalicular, very, very good. So juxtacanalicular is going to be the, uh, the part that is going to be responsible for most of the resistance to aqueous outflow. So you have the uveal scleral meshwork, the corneal scleral meshwork, then the juxtacanalicular, which is abutting the um, inner wall of Schlem's canal. And this is Schlem's canal. And then you've got these outlet channels that are going to aqueous veins, episcleral veins, superior ophthalmic vein, et cetera. Um, let's see here. Okay, composition of aqueous. So here's another one. You're like, do I really need to remember 20.15 and 27.52 in order to pass the boards? Yes, yes, you do. No, I'm just joking. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> but they could ask you things like relative differences. They, they they like to see like what things make the aqueous unique to plasma. Um, <clears throat> So there's a way there's a way to look at this and make it make sense without having to memorize it. Okay, so how can we look at this and and um, and not memorize anything, but know the answer to each of these? So what do we know about what do we know about the metabolism of the lens in the eye? Is it what what what, what sort of metabolism? Um, is the lens your crystalline lens using? Uh, 